This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. We see here section 8, the approach to exam questions. Now, given the fact that we're likely to see IHT being examined as a 10 mark question in section B, which of course will be made up of five individual explicit objective testing questions totaling some 10 marks, are otherwise topped up thereafter with a handful, probably one, two, maybe maximum three such questions, objective testing questions again, separate issues tested in section A, then the approach to exam questions is very simple because all it is is answer the explicit requirement in front of you as regards that two mark exercise. What we're going to see in example one below is a more traditional style just to test out that you've understood what the basic techniques are. I'll outline now here in section eight the way in which that question may be put together in terms of a real examination question where it would be split out into five individual requirements, as we say, each of two marks each, rather than here's an exercise, 10 marks at the end of it. So in an examination question, the following approach should be adopted. But as we've said, as this is likely to be a section B question, in addition to one or two section A questions, the requirement themselves will be explicit, requiring you to focus on any or all of the steps listed below. So whereas example one is to compute the IHT that was payable either in lifetime, well, in lifetime, and also as a result of the death of the taxpayer, young Joe, as you'll see in example one there, what you're going to get is individual exercises. And it will take you through the process because you have to do certain things first to be able to get through to an eventual computing the amount of IHT that may be payable in relation to the chargeable estate. So if we've got that mix of lifetime transfers, and also, of course, the death estate. We're going to have to deal with the lifetime transfers first, very specifically dealing with CLTs. But to be able to deal with any and all lifetime transfers, you have to be able to do that as a first step. And that is to work from the transfer of value, should such an exercise be required, to the chargeable transfer. The chargeable transfer, of course, is going to demand that you take out exemptions away from the transfer of value to bring you down to the chargeable transfer. So compute the chargeable transfer for each lifetime gift. Again, go back if necessary to illustration 13 to see how we did that. Again, there's a possible first exercise, compute the transfer of value, and that's where you'd have shares in an unquoted company and you'd be disposing, giving away some, but not all of your shares. And it would be tested that uh, loss in value principle, whereby we looked at the difference between what did the taxpayer have before the transfer and what did the taxpayer have after the transfer. We may get uh, otherwise a simple exercise whereby the transfer of value is very obvious, gave away cash of a hundred thousand pounds, two hundred thousand, four hundred thousand pounds, whatever it is, gave away a property or a whatever that was valued at, whereby there is no work to do for the transfer of value. It is the market value of each individual asset that was gifted. We're gonna never we're never gonna have to deal with more than two or three transfers. Indeed if it's a section A question, we may only have to deal with one such transfer. But we don't have to deal with uh, more than two or three. Three at maximum, I would suggest for you there. So we may have to charge all transfers. OK, what were the transfers of value? The cash valued at, the property valued at, the chattel valued at, whatever it might be. And take away, and that's the application, of course, of other marriage exemptions available. How do the annual exemptions apply? How do we apply those in terms of if we have a brought forward unused amount from the preceding year, how does that interplay with the current year's annual exemption? So we've got that work to do to get chargeable transfers. If there is a CLT, then second phase, 
If any CRTs have been made, then you're going to have to do a computation to work out, of course, any IHT that was payable in relation to lifetime transfers chargeable when made, as per illustration 11. Again, you've got a reference point to go back and check out. Do you know how to do that computation? To compute any tax payable, it must be ascertained who paid the tax. Is it the donor paying the tax or is it the donees, i.e. the trustees there? Once you've established that, you may be explicitly told to determine then the tax rate to apply above the nil rate band. Firstly, of course, we have available the nil rate band. Once that has been used, it's then in relation to that CLT, chargeable when made, is the bit above the nil rate band to be taxed at 20% or 25%. Are the trustees paying the tax, therefore 20%, or is the donor paying the tax, therefore 25%? That difference between a gross and a net transfer there. Simply enough, who pays, that, depend, that determines rather whether or not it's going to be 25% for the donor paying, 20% if the trustees are paying. How do you know? Well, you may be explicitly told. If you weren't explicitly told in relation to such a CLT, then you make the assumption that it was the donor that paid. Because if the trustees are to pay, they have to elect. They'll be instructed so to do by the donor, but they would be electing to make the payment for the tax out of the trust fund. So if there's no comment about any such election having been made by the trustees, we can only assume that there was no such election. And on that basis, it is the donor that will pay, and therefore a 25% rate again on the excess of that transfer above the nil rate band. Once you've dealt with the lifetime tax payable and established in relation to that tr transfer, the gross amount of chargeable transfer, we can then turn our attention to, which inevitably will have happened in any such uh, section B question, the death of the taxpayer. And that means we have to look firstly at, before we deal with the chargeable state, Firstly, at those lifetime transfers that are chargeable on death. That's the next computation for us to head up, as it were, albeit in our workings, which are only for your use, because the only thing that the examiner sees here in section A and section B, have you chosen the correct option? And that's it. But on the death of the taxpayer, any lifetime transfers, CLTs, or pets made within the seven years of the death are now included in the computation and we have to compute the tax. Remember, of course, if there are CLTs more than seven years before the date of death, remember that they are not necessarily going to be chargeable to tax, but they may impact, as we'll see later in the final session, we will see later that they may impact on that which is chargeable to IHT. So, you will be bothered about CLTs made more than seven years before the date of death, not because of the fact that there would be tax on them, because you've survived more than seven years, there will be no such tax. But what it will impact on, given the cumulative nature of this tax, is the amount of tax payable on those transfers that do fall within the seven years before death and will be taxed as a result. But that's for a later session. That's the last technical issue that we look at within this chapter. All we see so far is there's the transfers. They're only within the seven years before death. Establish, therefore, any additional tax payable in relation to CLTs and the tax that is payable in relation to pets. There, of course, we're all us also interested in those exact time gaps within the seven years before death, but with some of the lifetime transfers between three and seven years before death, and therefore taper relief would have applied. But what does taper relief apply to? It relates to the tax charge. It doesn't reduce what is chargeable to tax, it reduces the amount of tax itself. So we'd have to do with that. Again, illustrations 10 and 12 there for you to have a go at. And finally, in computational terms, it's the chargeable estate is established, which is basically a listing exercise, of course, there. 
we establish that chargeable estate, we look to see whether there is still any available nil rate band. We're also looking to apply not just the nil rate band, but the residence nil rate band as well. In terms of both the nil rate and the residence nil rate band, we're also having to read the question carefully to see whether or not any unused nil rate or residence nil rate bands would have come over from the previously deceased spouse or civil partner. Again, that will be explicitly stated within the question if it is to be relevant. Remember though, although the nil rate band firstly applies to the lifetime transfers within the seven years before death, before then if there's anything left over reverting to the chargeable estate, the residence nil rate band is only available on the chargeable estate at death and then only if the main residence has been left to a direct descendant. So there you see four potential exercises out of five that will be set for you in any section B question. Though again, any of those could be broken down into subsections as well. On any one of those sections, most notably this one, there doesn't have to be, of course, just one question, there could be two. Or indeed, it could be at the end a more narrative-based question, a knowledge-based question. It may also be required to state by whom and by when the IHT should be paid. As we said, in short exam questions, as stated above, not all of the above steps will be necessary. Or a section B question will be divided, as we've said, into the individual objective testing questions, each of two marks. And I've got to take you through it in a logical way. Now that actually makes life a whole lot easier for you than if you were simply given the type of requirement I've given you on example one, which we'll be talking about soon. In relation to that, you have to know the approach. You have to do things in the order I've set them out there. An exam question being section B has to take you through in an order that, well, you've got to be able to do question one before question two, question two before three, three before four, etc., etc. there. So that makes it easier in terms of, I don't have to devise a plan of how to answer this particular question, the order in which I should deal with the issues raised within the question, because that is set for me in terms of those explicit requirements for each of those five questions. Okay, that therefore is the overall approach um, you're going to be uh, tested out here in terms of example one, and we'll be doing that in a moment's time. But uh, that tests you out in terms of all of the techniques that we have seen so far. And just have a quick recap in terms of any of those issues that I've just mentioned before we attempt to deal with example one. Well, at the end of our previous session, we saw what was the approach to exam questions. Understanding, of course, that in terms of those exam questions, anything in section A will be an individual two mark objective testing question. And your scenario based question, which is what we're about to deal with here in terms of example one, your scenario based question is itself broken down into five individual requirements. Now, of course, those particular parts may represent the different issues that you see here. Again, broken into maybe one or maybe two uh, questions on each of those particular parts of the problem. But we've got to follow this process in order to get us through, as it were, from the start in terms of what happens in lifetime and ultimately what happens on death. Maybe a little bit of admin at the end as to when the tax may be paid and by whom it may be paid. Let's just remind ourselves, though, about what that process is. The first exercise here in the first point to compute the chargeable transfer for each lifetime gift. So we've got to look at the lifetime gifts that are relevant so far as our uh, computation is concerned and establish what is the chargeable transfer. How do we do that? Well, we look at whether we've got pets or CLTs and list them out and go through on a chronological basis applying, of course, the various exemptions as appropriate to the transfer of value figure, a transfer of value that we may indeed have had to have computed for ourselves. That will give us the chargeable transfer figure. 
Now, those chargeable transfer figures are likely in the exam question to be a combination of CLTs and PETs there. Again, probably two of one, maybe one of the other, whichever way round they want it to be. But a combination of CLTs and PETs. And if there are CLTs, that's again a given almost for a section B question. Then if any CLTs have been made in the computation, then we need to put together the computation for lifetime transfers chargeable when made. Now again, that will only include CLTs. We exclude PETs from this. We will be using the IHT rates and uh, nil rate band applicable at the date of the CLT in terms of if that only includes transactions within the previous seven years. We'll be dealing with the death for the Finance Act 19 anyway, probably in the 1920 tax year. And seven years back, we've always had a nil rate band. All the way back to 0910, we've had a nil rate band, of course, of the current £325,000. But as we'll see in the next lecture, we may indeed be taken back to dates prior to even that. Odd, though that may sound at the moment. But it's not a problem in this first example we're going to be dealing with. So, establish the chargeable transfer figure for each lifetime transfer, whether it's a PET, whether it's a CLT. Our working moves through from left to right across the page, looking chronologically at each of those PETs and CLTs working from transfer of value down to the chargeable transfer figure. We then pick up from that table any CLTs, and that allows us to do our first IHT computation. That, of course, being the lifetime transfers chargeable when made. When dealing with that, of course, we need to have identified within the question not just the amount of the chargeable transfer that is the CLT, but also who is paying any tax thereon. Is it a net or is it a gross transfer? Who is paying the tax? Net transfer if the donor pays, gross transfer if the trustees pay. We then get through to inevitably what will have happened within such a question, the death of the taxpayer. And that death requires then two further computations. The first of which here in section three, and that is where, of course, we're going to be working out the calculation of or lifetime transfers chargeable on death. Now that's where, of course, anything falling within the seven years before death, be they pets, be they CLTs, will fall chargeable. Pets, of course, for the one and only time. But CLTs may have had, of course, some amount of lifetime tax paid thereon. I say may because certainly a CLT could potentially be covered entirely by the then nil rate band. But if there were any lifetime tax, that would have to be deducted. But that, of course, would only be deducted after having applied taper relief. Taper relief, of course, will apply both to PETs and CLTs. We have something that's chargeable because it's made within the seven years of the date of death. But if that transfer made in lifetime, be it CLT or PET, is more than three years prior to the date of death, then taper relief is available. Now again, you probably remember, of course, the levels of taper relief, moving from 20% if we survive for between three to four years from the date of the transfer to the date of death, 20% for that, up to a maximum 80% taper relief if we survive for between six and seven years from the date of transfer to the date of death there. Not that you need to remember those figures because, of course, that table is provided to you on your rates and allowances pages. Once you've dealt with the lifetime transfers chargeable on death, we can then move to our chargeable estate. Now, we could compute the chargeable estate at any point in time. It wouldn't have to be done last. You could do it first. But the only problem is you would then need to know what value of lifetime transfers were chargeable within the seven years before death to know whether or not in taxing that chargeable estate we had, of course, any amounts of nil rate band available. What you've also got to consider, and consider only, of course, on the chargeable estate at death, is the availability of any residence nil rate band. And that's based on, was there, as referred to, a main residence held by the taxpayer, 
at, at the date of death. And then, of course, to whom has that gone? It's got to be a direct descendant in relation to the availability of the residence nil rate band. In each case, as regards those basic, the basic normal 325,000 nil rate band, and also the very specific residence nil rate band, you also need to know whether or not the spouse or civil partner of the individual who has sadly now died predeceased this particular taxpayer and whether then they used some or all of their original nil rate bands and residence nil rate bands. Because if they didn't, then of course the relevant proportion that was unused passes now through to their, well as was, surviving spouse, but sadly now deceased. But the unused nil rate bands would have to be computed from the first death of the first spouse or civil partner to die. So plenty to keep us thinking about there. But remember, in terms of a section B question, these explicit requirements will be broken down to do do this for two marks, do that for two marks there. What we will see here is our overall approach going through this order because we have to go through this order to get to the end figures of tax arising as a result of the death of the taxpayer, and we'll show it in that form. Again, at any point, any one of the five questions within the section B question could be asking you for a specific figure. Like, for example, the first computation we'll be doing, once we've read through the question, will be to compute those chargeable transfer figures. Right. Example one, what do they want us to do? Compute the amount of IHT payable both during Joe's lifetime and upon his death. Right, during Joe's lifetime. That therefore would mean we're only talking about CLTs. Do we have any transfers into trust? And upon his death. That of course means we're looking at two computations there the lifetime transfers now chargeable on death that will be any lifetime transfers falling of course within the seven years of the date of death and then our chargeable estate so in total some three computations but to be able to deal with the clts that were chargeable when made and all of the lifetime transfers chargeable on death we need to know for each lifetime transfer what was the chargeable transfer figure. Before we get to that computation, let's just read through the information, the question, as we would in the exam, and pick up, of course, what the relevant figures and relevant issues are. So here we go. Died on April the 1st, 21 there. Again, we have our hero, Joker, uh, a very practical man who sadly died, appropriately, on the 1st of April 2021. Now, that, of course, is relevant because we're going to have to go back in terms of looking at the lifetime transfers some seven years before that. So that would take us back to the 1st of April 14. And any transfers from that date through to the uh, date of death there, falling within the seven years before the date of death, they will become chargeable on death. What did Joe do in terms of his will? Leaving £250,000 to his wife. A transfer to a spouse. What do you know about that? That is exempt. The remainder of his estate to his son, that therefore will form the basis of the chargeable estate. In calculating the chargeable estate, we will have listed out as we'll see here, the assets held by Joe at the date of the uh, at the date of his death, and we will then have deduct any exemptions. Now, the only exemption available on death in our syllabus, anyway, is transfers to spouses or civil partners. And there we've got two hundred and fifty thousand pounds to his wife. That is to be deducted in deriving the value of the chargeable estate. That chargeable estate then is the bit that goes to his son, 
and that of course will then require uh, the tax computation thereon. So what did he have? At the date of his death, Joe owned the following assets. Now here's some interesting language. His principal private main residence, valued at £300,000. Now for IHT purposes, the only important words here are main residence. Because if it is your main residence, then depending on where you are now bequeathing that main residence, that of course would be eligible or may be eligible for the residence nil rate band. Now, of course, the value that we take into the estate will be the value of the property, £300,000, less we've got an outstanding repayment mortgage. So this is to be deducted, the amount at the date of death, 80000 So that will net out to some £220,000 there. Now, will the residence nil rate band be available to you? Well, yes, because... £250,000 was being gifted to the wife and the remainder of the estate, we may reasonably assume therefore that that includes that main residence, is transferred to the son, i.e. a direct descendant there. So on that basis, we will have the resident nil rate band available to us. Now, there's no reference here to any previous spouse having existed and having transferred any unused nil rate band or residence nil rate band across to Joe. So we don't have any problems as regards unused nil rate bands of a former spouse here. So that means we've got our basic figure, which for 1920 tax year is £150,000 there. That being lower than the net value of the main residence, means we'll get the full £150,000 deduction as regards that, sorry, that, that residence nil rate band, not as a deduction, that nil rate of tax there of £150,000 will apply in relation to the chargeable estate, which contains that property with a net value of £220,000 there. One further issue. These words, principal, private, and then we've got residence. That might trigger something in your heads. Principal, private, residence. Oh, I seem to remember there was a principal, private, residence relief. Does that mean it's exempt? No. Examiners may give you enough rope, as we've seen before, by which to hang yourself there. Terms that we are aware of from a different tax used within a question on a different tax to that one. Principal private residence relief is a CGT issue. It has nothing to do with IHT. Your main residence is probably the main value asset for most taxpayers within their chargeable estate there. So don't go thinking, ah, oh, this is PPR. It's that relief. That means it's exempt. No, it doesn't. This is IHT, not CGT. So don't be taken in. And we'll see that issue with other assets listed here that might again provoke a thought about using the word exempt, but that is applicable to a different tax. It's not applicable here. A holiday home valued at 140000 We've got the value. Bank and Building Society deposits valued at 230. ISAs with a market value of 50,000. ISAs, now again, you might think, ISAs, ISAs, mm, I've seen that before as well. Ah, they were exempt. Well, they were exempt in terms of the income from them for income tax and any disposal of them from CGT. There's no exemption in terms of IHT, so they are again to be included as a part of your chargeable estate. We've also got 12,000 shares in Joe Limited, which we're told there are valued at that date at £20 per share. So that's a simple exercise to perform. We've got a life assurance policy. Again, here what they may do, and if they do, we need to know how to choose between two different values. An open market value that existed at the date of death 
and the figure that we need, which are the proceeds from that particular policy. And that's £140,000 received following Joe's death. That is the figure for us then to include within the chargeable estate. Now, again, given that it's objective testing questions, you're not going to put, as we will show you in the back of these notes, a formal answer where we list out very, uh, hopefully neatly and tidily, the content of the estate. All we need to do is to add up numbers to get the value of the estate. Take out, of course, any exemptions. We know we've got that in relation to the gift to the bequest to the wife there establish the chargeable estate figure. We can't yet, of course, do the tax calculation there on because we don't know about the lifetime transfers and whether, as will probably be the case, and will here be the case, that we'll end up, of course, having used up all of our nil rate band on the transfers within the seven years before death. Remember, of course, that the residence nil rate band will not have been used up. It is only applicable to that main residence held within the estate at death. It's not applicable to any lifetime gifts of a main residence. OK, so we'll come back to that. But of course, in getting the value of the chargeable estate, we said it was like a balance sheet and that has both assets and liabilities. So we're told that Joe had outstanding credit card bills of 6000 that's an allowable liability, and that therefore, existing at the date of death, will be deducted. That's an allowable deduction. But then it also verbally promised to pay the medical expenses of £1,000 of a friend. That is not a legally enforceable debt. That will not be an allowable deduction in establishing the value of the chargeable estate. Funeral expenses. Yeah, we've got that lovely point about reasonable funeral expenses. Again, that might seem like a big number, but again, that is going to be taken. And you automatically assume here, unless it was an incredibly large number, where they might tell you uh, spent £50,000 on the funeral, whereas a funeral would normally cost £6,000. Reasonable funeral expenses would be the figure to be allowable as a deduction. So that too is an allowable deduction there. So we can deduct the credit card bills and the funeral expenses, again, in deriving the value of the chargeable estate. And now we get down to the trickier part. And that is, of course, the lifetime transfers that were made. Now, remember, we're, again, only taxing on the death of the taxpayer those transfers that were made in the seven years before death. If, of course, we've got a CLT, then we also need to establish any lifetime tax that was payable thereon and do that computation before dealing, the death, dealing with the death computation. But what have we got? What was the date of the death there? Uh, Joe passed away, sadly, on the 1st of April 2021 there. So our first lifetime transfer, they're given here in chronological order, was on the 20th of November 14. Well, seven years on from the 20th of November 14 would be the 20th of November 21. Our hero, as we saw, just died on the 1st of April, i.e. that is within seven years of that transfer. So this particular transfer is relevant. What type of transfer is it? Well, it's a cash gift of £40,000. And there we go. That was the critical information to his son. That therefore means that it is a pet. It is also on the occasion of his wedding. Hmm, anything special there about weddings? Well, obviously there's lots of things special about weddings there, but in terms of IHT, it is of course about the marriage exemption. And where it is from parent through to child, that is a 5,000 marriage exemption. But of course, as well as those very specific exemptions, like the marriage exemption there, there is also the more general annual exemption that needs to be dealt with. Again, do make sure that down here or in any of the requirements to any of the questions, they don't say something like 
ignore annual exemptions. If they did, of course, we would ignore them. But assuming that that is not going to happen, we need to recognise what annual exemptions would be available. Assuming that there were no prior transfers to this, they told us everything we need to know, then this transfer, dated the 20th of November 14, that therefore falls in the 1415 tax year. So it would be eligible for the annual exemption for 1415. And as we can see that, uh, again, after even the marriage exemption of 5,000, taken away from 40,000, there's still a lot of transfer that would be chargeable. So as well as firstly using the current year's annual exemption, we would also be able to then deduct the annual exemption that was, we must assume, unused from the previous tax year, and that would be 1314. So look at what we got from that initial reading of that one line. The nature of that lifetime transfer is a pet. It will only be chargeable on the death of the taxpayer and only if that is within the seven years of the date of death. We've established that it is within the seven years. We know the value, the transfer of value. It's a cash gift of £40,000. But we need to work the chargeable transfer and that's after deducting those lifetime exemptions. Firstly, the specific exemption, the marriage exemption here of 5,000. Why? Because it's to the child of the individual, here to Joe's son. And also then any available annual exemptions. Firstly, the current year, that's 1415, followed by the preceding year, 1340. We move on. 15th of July 15. We're now into the 1516 tax year. And that's going to mean that, of course, here we'll have available the annual exemption for 1516. We've already used the 1415. So this July 15 transfer will only benefit from the one annual exemption for the tax year that it falls in, the 1516 tax year transferred 405,000, there's your transfer of value, into a trust. So now we know critically that this is a CLT. And what do we then also need to know about that? Because when you see that figure is 405,000, even after the deduction of an annual exemption, we are clearly going to exceed 325,000 pounds. And that means that any amount of this chargeable transfer above the available nil rate band that again in lifetime would have been £325,000 that therefore was going to be chargeable in lifetime at the relevant lifetime rate. Remember when dealing with CLTs on the very first IHT computation we prepare lifetime transfers chargeable when made, then we ignore any pets other than the fact that, as we've just seen, they would have taken advantage of any annual exemptions that existed. But other than that, the first and only computation for lifetime transfers chargeable when made, first and only transaction for that, is going to be the transfer into the trust. And for that, the lifetime tax chargeable when made, we need to know who pays. And we're told, transferred into the trust and paid the IHT due thereon. So Joe, the donor, paid. That therefore means that it is a net transfer. So when we come to the computation, any excess above the then available nil rate band is going to be taxed at 25%. More of that later. The last of the lifetime transfers, the 8th of December 19. Now that one, of course, is falling in the 1920 tax year. So we've got AE 1920. Have we used 1819? No, we haven't. So we'll have the 1819 annual exemption available as well. Let's see what it is 
gave 4,000 shares in Joe Limited to his son. So again, we're dealing with a pet. Just like the first transfer, we have a pet here. But when dealing with shares in what we'll discover here is as it's limited and unquoted company, we have to use, where appropriate, that transfer of value principle, where we look not at the market value of the shares being gifted. That is what you'd have dealt with at the time when dealing with the CGT implication. But what we do instead is to look at the transfer of value measured as the difference between what did the taxpayer have before the transfer and what does the taxpayer have after the transfer. So what have we got? Prior to the gift, Joe owned 16,000 of the 20,000 shares in Joe Limited. Now you can see down here that as regards percentage shareholdings, we get different values per share. And very clearly and practically, of course, as in reality, the bigger the interest you have in such a company, the higher the price per share. No one's probably interested in a 1% interest in an unquoted company. I am rather more interested in 51%, 75%, 100%. And therefore, the bigger the interest, the higher the share price. So what we're going to have to do to compute the transfer of value before then deducting any exemptions, we've seen that two annual exemptions would be available here. But to get the transfer of value, we look at what did he have before 16,000 shares with what did he have after having given away 4,000? Well, that will be 12,000 shares. And then apply the relevant price for those two relevant shareholdings. To begin with, 16,000 shares out of 20,000. 16 out of 20 is an 80% shareholding. So here, in terms of the 80% shareholding, £25 per share, your transfer of value computation would be based on, before the transfer, 16,000 shares held. After the transfer, given away 4,000, 4 from 16 is 12,000 out of a total of 20. That therefore is going to be some 60%. A 60% shareholding has an 18 pounds per share, so times 12,000 pounds. The difference between those two figures will be your transfer of value, and we'll see that computation in a moment's time. We're also told that the nil rate ban from the tax year 1415 has always been 325. Well, we knew that anyway, but they'll tell you. If you have to use a nil rate ban from a tax year earlier than your current tax year, for us it's the 1920 tax year, then they'll tell you what that figure is. Also, they want to find the comment here, of course, share valuations agreed with HMRC at that date were as follows. Uh, yeah. Those are the figures that we can uh, validly use here. All right, so we picked up a lot of information here from that first read through. We understand what will be the eventual content of the chargeable estate and how to put it together. Though we'll leave that exercise in the detailed form to the end. We also know that we've got both types of lifetime transfer having occurred within the seven years before death. There is a lifetime transfer chargeable when made, a CLT, a transfer into trust. It was the only one made, remember, in the computation, the IHT computation of lifetime transfers chargeable when made. We only include CLTs. We ignore pets on that computation. They, pets, are not chargeable when made. They are only chargeable if you die within seven years. So that means that given the amount we had, OK, the transfer of value was 405. It's going to be diminished by an annual exemption, I think it was there. But we're still going to have a figure that takes us above the then available nil rate band in 1415. Oh, tax year 1415. That, of course, should be 1516. Uh, again, possibly by the time you see this lecture, that will already have been updated. 
sorry, uh, that should have been updated from an early year. So there, 15th of July, 15 there, that's in the 15, 16 tax year. It's 325,000. We knew it was going to be. We've had 325 since 09, 10 tax year. Okay. Going back to our approach, therefore, albeit you are guided in your section B question, if that is the most likely place to find it, I think you will there. But that's where it is, by the individual questions. What is each of the five questions specifically asking you to do? But to be able to move on to any of the IHT computations, which are clearly going to be a part of these requirements, a fundamental part, you're going to have to compute the chargeable transfer for each lifetime gift. Now, it's perfectly possible that an exam question may give you those figures and simply ask you then to go on and work the uh, computation of the tax. That's maybe more likely within a section A rather than a section B question, but it could happen. Here, it hasn't. We have to work out transfers of value. We know what they are now. We've done that. Take away the exemptions. We know what they are and get the chargeable transfer. So what I'd like you to do, therefore, is to set up that first computation of the chargeable transfers. You will list them out chronologically across the page from the earliest to the latest. We had November 14, July 15, December 19 in there. You will state what each of them is, a PET, a CLT, a PET. You will compute the transfer of value. One of those will require a working. The other ones are just taken straight from the question, of course. Again, in terms of any OT question, it is not a working that you have to identify to show. That only happens in section C. The basis of, of course, a transfer of value uh, calculation on the shares was this exercise here. You know what needs to be done, you work it out. So work for me, please, the chargeable transfer figure. So pause at this point, work the chargeable transfer figures, and we'll pick it up from that once you've done it. OK, well, let's see how we fared on our first task there. Now, again, we should be familiar with the working uh, required to get our chargeable transfer figures here. And that is we list out across the top of the page by date order there the transactions that have occurred, the transfers made within the seven years before the date of death. We get the transfer of value figures. Those, of course, in the case of the PET on November 14 and the CLT July 15 are cash figures given directly within the question. This one, of course, the PET for December 19, that we had to work out for our ourselves. That was the classic transfer of value exercise the difference between what we had before and what we had after the transfer. We had 16,000 shares prior to the uh, gift of those shares. That was an 80% interest and they were valued at £25 a share. That therefore in total would give us 400,000 as compared to afterwards. After that transfer, what do we have? 4,000 shares were given away, 12,000 shares remain, that was a 60% interest and they carried an £18 per share share price. Giving us in total 216, take one from the other, transfer of value 184,000. Now that could be a separate uh, question in its own right to compute what that transfer of value figure would indeed be. But otherwise, the figure we've now computed goes into our chargeable transfers working. And what do we do? We take away from that the various exemptions, transfer by transfer, in order to bring us down to the chargeable transfer figures. Those figures we need because they are then the figures to include within the various IHT computations, be it the lifetime transfers chargeable when made or the lifetime transfers then that are chargeable on death. We'd already identified on our first run through, our first reading of the question, that in relation to the November 14 pet there, we had a marriage exemption because it was to the son, that was 5,000. 
we then had two annual exemptions in order, remember, firstly the current year followed by the preceding year. Those were both £3,000 a piece. They've always been that. They've never changed. 3000 That means we've got a total of some, what, 11000 to deduct and hence a chargeable transfer computed at £29,000. For the CLT, there was just one exemption available, the standard annual exemption, available just for the tax year in which it fell, 1516. That was £3,000. That PET there, though not chargeable when made, only chargeable on death, will have been deemed to have used the relevant annual exemptions for the year in which it was made, and if necessary, as here, for the year prior to that as well. So we've only got one annual exemption to go against the value of the CLT, and that therefore reduces that just slightly, but down to £402,000. The final pet, the transfer of the shares, we've done our transfer of value, there were no other transfers made in that 1920 tax year, so it enjoyed that annual exemption. We didn't have any transfers in 1819, so that's an unused exemption. It's brought forward the one year it's able to be carried forward for, and that gives us two lots of 3,000. That therefore is 6,000 away from 184, and there's our 178,000. Step one, done we computed the chargeable transfers. Step two was the first of the IHT computations to be prepared. And that, of course, was for lifetime transfers chargeable when made. That is only CLTs. We've got one of them there in July 15. So what you now need to do is to set up that computation that you can just see here at the bottom of the screen lifetime transfers chargeable when made. Now, what you will need, oops, don't want to show you too much there, give it, oh, give it all away. You can probably see it anyway on the page in front of you. But look away. You need to have three columns, a working column, into which the basic chargeable transfer figure will go, your 402,000. You then, based on who pays any tax above the available nil rate band, compute the IHT, and if, as was the case here, I think we saw it was a net transfer, then of course we add the chargeable transfer to the tax to give us the gross transfer. So if we just pause at this particular point in time and have a quick go at that, it shouldn't take you more than about a minute, I hope, to do that computation. Okay, let's see what we have then in this lifetime transfers chargeable when made. Now, do understand that when dealing with lifetime transfers chargeable when made, as we know, we're only dealing with CLTs. We know the amount of that CLT, 402,000, and it goes into this working column here. But also understand that it is only, as only these transfers are chargeable, pets were not chargeable when made, and only on death if you died within seven years of them that you are applying the then available nil rate bands that existed. For us, of course, it's likely to still be the 325,000 as it is here. It is only the CLTs that are consuming that in lifetime. You don't hear say, oh, but we had this pet that predated it. That was 29,000 pounds. Has that therefore used 29,000 of the nil rate band? Not in lifetime not on this computation. When you do this computation, again, sneaking in just beneath this, just at the bottom of your screen, lifetime transfers chargeable on death, then yes, that pet there back in, when was it, uh, November 14, does become chargeable. And therefore, it will be taken account of. It will use the first part of the nil rate band that was in force at the date of death which is still £325,000, of course, there. But here, lifetime transfers, chargeable when made, no. There is only the CLTs. How much was the figure? We know 402. That goes above 325, so the full 325 nil rate band is available. It's the only, it's the first CLT that has ever been made by the taxpayer. 
That therefore uses up the 325 nil rate band and means that out of the 402, it leaves 77,000 to be then taxed at 25%. Why? It's a net transfer. Why is it a net transfer, demanding the net rate of 25% to be applied to this figure rather than the gross rate of 20%? It is that because the donor, Joe, paid the tax there on. So 25% of that, hopefully 19,250, that goes into your IHT column. Because this transfer was a net transfer, to get the gross amount of the transfer, you add the two figures together. The amount of chargeable transfer figure plus the amount of tax there on, because both of those figures diminish the value of the estate. We've already worked out the chargeable transfer figure, but also, of course, what further diminishes the value of the taxpayer's estate. Joe pays that amount of tax out. That reduces the value of the estate. So the gross is the combination of the chargeable transfer, 402, the IHT 19250, 421250. And that was it. There was only one CLT there in that particular exercise. Now, we need to know this figure. Of course, this was July 15. You're dealing with the date of the death of the taxpayer. We're dealing with that debt in, what was it, 2021, 1st of April 2021 there. So what we understand and what we have seen is that every one of the three lifetime transfers that we are informed of has fallen within the seven years before the date of death. So each of these is going to be chargeable. Now we know the chargeable transfer figures for both of the pets, the 29,000, the 178,000. And those become chargeable once, only on the occasion of death. They will be charged a tax just the once and at the rates applicable at the date of death. The 402,000, as was for the CLT, that was chargeable when made, and the gross amount of that transfer will also go into this computation here, the lifetime transfers chargeable on death, because it too falls within the seven years before the date of death. Of course, we will reflect the fact that some lifetime tax to be precise, £19,250 of lifetime tax has already been paid. And that will serve to reduce what may be otherwise any additional tax that needs to be paid as a result of the death of the taxpayer. But of course, even before we reduce the tax charge within the computation, lifetime transfers chargeable on death, even before we'd reduce that tax charge by the amount of lifetime tax paid, there is another deduction, of course, that is available not just to CLTs, but also to pets. Any transfers that are now chargeable, pets and CLTs, on death, because they were made within the seven years before the date of death, any of those transfers, if they are, though less than seven years, and they're hence chargeable, they are more than three years from the date of the death of the taxpayer, then of course taper relief is available to us. So you now have got to put together that computation. You don't need the little working column as we had here. We just need gross transfers and IHT, and we then go through in chronological order. Again, you can see firstly coming in there in November 14, that pet, where we know the chargeable transfer was 29,000. We use now the nil rate band that was in force at the date of death. That again was 325,000. But if it had changed, you now use in this computation, the nil rate band in force at the date of death. Then 29,000 is clearly less than 325. So there will be no tax. We will then pick up or you will then pick up the gross amount of the CLT. That, of course, will take you above 325,000, and therefore you'll then have to have 
however much of the nil rate band still available at nil. The balance of the chargeable transfer, the 421250, that goes above the nil rate band. Remember, this is now tax on death, and that brings with it that hideously high 40% IHT rate that is applicable. Once you've worked out a figure of tax, of course, look at the dates. Yes, it's within seven years. Was it more than three years? If so, between how many and how many years from the date of death was that transfer to establish the level of taper relief? And that will then be applied. But because it was a CLT, as we've said, we've also got the lifetime tax to deduct there. Regarding the first transfer, the original PET of 29,000, taper relief is irrelevant because taper relief only applies if there's a tax charge. It's a reduction in the tax charge. 29,000 was all within the nil rate band, so there was no tax charge. It's only relevant in relation to the tax charge. Once you've dealt with that one, of course, you've then got a further PET to deal with dated December 19. You know the figure. Establish, of course, whether taper relief would also be relevant for that one. I'll leave you to decide on that. So can you please complete this computation for me? Pause now and you have a go at that. OK, picking up it again then on the lifetime transfers chargeable on death. Hopefully a successful exercise on your part there. We knew that we go through from the earliest transfer within the seven years before the date of death through to the date of death and deal with each of those lifetime transfers, whether a PET or a CLT in course. The first one, November 14, a PET, a mere 29,000, well within the 325,000 nil rate band, so no tax to pay. Bring in the gross amount of the CLT there from your lifetime tax computation. That was 421,250. Clearly, that takes you above 325,000 on this cumulative total. When we add 421,250 there to the 29,000, we've got 450,250 pounds. How much of the 421,250 is chargeable at above nil rate? Well, what nil rate band was left? From the 325, you've used 29, that leaves 296. 296 is at nil. 296 out of 421,250, that leaves 125,250 pounds, therefore, and that will be taxed at 40%. That, all being well, comes to 50,100, and there is your tax figure now to include. Now that's your tax figure based on the use of the nil rate band. But of course, it isn't the amount of tax that has to be paid as a result of the death of the taxpayer within the seven years of making that transfer into the trust. What we have to begin with, you must do them in this order, is taper relief. So again, the date of this transfer was July 15, so you count forward. July 15, so July 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, ah, had lived for five, doesn't live for six years, between five to six years, therefore 60% level of taper relief, deduct that from your original tax charge calculation. And because there was lifetime tax paid, we now deduct that lifetime tax paid that figure taken from the previous computation, 19,250. So we started with £50,100 as the 40% charge on the excess above the nil rate band. But of course, we end up after taper relief, after deducting lifetime tax paid, with a mere £790 there. That additional tax due to be paid, that will have to be paid, of course, by the trustees nobody else left to pay that, paid by the trustees, taking, of course, that £790 out of the value of the trust itself. One final pet to deal with here, December 19, 
Now, of course, December 19, with the date of death of April 1st, 2021, that is within three years. So here, there'll be no taper relief. It's a pet, so there's no lifetime tax paid. We have already used up our nil rate band. The cumulative total at this point, within the seven years before the date of death, is over £450,000. So all of the 178 is chargeable at 40%. That's 71,200, and that's it, because there's no taper relief, and of course there is no lifetime tax that has been paid. In relation to the pet, um, who pays that? The donee. Don't add down any total here in this IHT column, unless a question, and it's very unlikely that it would specifically ask you to do that, to calculate it, because those are separate liabilities. Whoever benefited from that first pet, I think it was the son, paid no tax on the £29,000 chargeable figure. The trustees of the trust end up paying additional tax of £790 on top of what they had paid or what had been paid. It was the donor who paid it, Joe, but on top of what had been paid in relation to the lifetime transfer that was chargeable when it was made. That 790 paid by the trustees. As a totally separate payment, again, I think it was the son that benefited from that particular pet, they would, he, or she, he, obviously, not she, he would have to pay the £71,200. So the 790 and the 71200 are separate liabilities. Right, that's the hardest part done, that computation, the lifetime transfers charge upon death, and it means that all that now you're required to do is to put together your computation of the chargeable estate at death. There is no need, as there wouldn't be any need in the exam in an objective testing question, to formally list them out as I've shown in this particular answer. You would already have picked up the numbers from the reading of the question. Just get your calculator out. Make sure you use it very carefully, of course. List out the values of the assets take out any debts or liabilities, take out any exemption, don't forget the spouse exemption here, in terms of what was left to her by Joe, get the chargeable estate. You will then know that given that in lifetime, in the seven years before the date of death, you had that amount of transfer, clearly there is no nil rate band that still remains to go against the chargeable estate at death. But there is, of course, still a nil rate band to use, a very specific one. Don't forget to apply it. Over to you now. Work that figure for me, please. You can check it out with the answer there, but I'll have a quick chat with you before we bring this uh, lecture to a close. OK, let's see what you've got there for. Your list will have included. You've got your uh, main residence, which after the mortgage had come to, a figure we'd already identified on the question page as being 220. We've got the holiday home. We've got the bank and building society deposits. We've got the ISAs. Yes, all of this is chargeable. There's no exemption here in IHT. We've got the shares at their given value at the date of death there. And we've got the life assurance proceeds to come in, bringing us to an asset total of £1,020,000. Take away your debts, liabilities due at the date of death, and also any reasonable funeral expenses there. Take those out, £12,000, and then, of course, any exempt bequests, i.e. to spouses or civil partners there. That was two fifty, and that brings us to a chargeable estate of 758,000. So having got the chargeable estate at death there at uh, 758,000, as we said, it's now a matter of just taxing that. And of course, to tax the chargeable estate, you need to know whether any of the nil rate band is still available to you. Clearly, that's not the case here. We've had those gross chargeable transfers recorded within the seven years before death, amounting to £628,250, as we can see there. So we can see clearly that we fully used up the available nil rate band. But of course, although the nil rate band has been utilised, 
there is the issue about the residence nil rate band. And we do have that residence nil rate band available because not only do we have the main residence, which net of the repayment mortgages, we must always compute it, the figure to include within that net estate, we've got £220,000. And given that now we have a residence nil rate band of £175,000, that 175,000, of course, will now be at nil. We're benefiting from the residence nil rate band. Again, there's no transfer of unused nil rate or residence nil rate bands available to us here. That's not the background for our individual, for Joe here. So we've just got, he's used up his nil rate band, hasn't used up the residence nil rate band. Check, of course, yes, there's a main residence within that chargeable estate at death, but is it left to a direct descendant? Yes, it is left to a direct descendant. And on that basis, therefore, that residence nil rate band is available. That still leaves the balance of the 758,000, so 583,000 there, to be taxed at 40%, giving rise to that eventual liability in relation to the chargeable estate at death of just over £233,000 there. Remember, in terms of that uh, liability, it will, of course, be paid by the personal representatives and borne by the residuary legatee. Again, information that we didn't have to use here. We just wanted to, we just required to compute the amount of IHT payable in relation to the death of the taxpayer. But again, we also know who pays, who bears, and if necessary, when that tax would be payable as a result of the death of the taxpayer as well. They are all additional questions that may be required of you there. OK, that I think brings this particular session to an end, therefore. And as ever, we look forward to seeing you next time.